hi everyone, good afternoon. What I would like you to take you through in the upcoming 30 minutes is in my personal experience in the specific area of innovation. As Yonchi was mentioning before, I'm co-founder and managing partner of Bundle. And what we do on a daily day-to-day -day basis is Bundle is a venture development firm, which means that we team up with corporations and we tackle into new markets with them. And we do that by creating corporate ventures really from scratch. We go through minimum viable product and eventually we launch them on the market. Now, during the five to eight last couple of years, I've been involved in a lot of innovation projects. And what I would like to share with you today is the experience that I had with different corporations, as well as the startups or the SMEs that I've been working with. They all have certain struggles. And I want to share specifically the struggles that I've seen in corporations and how they were able to overcome these struggles. So that relates to the question, the quest for the best strategic response to the changing market. Now, if there is one thing they all have in common, and that might also be one of the reasons why you all are here, or maybe that's one of the reasons why you're here in this talk even specifically, is the fact that at this point, technology, technological growth is outpacing us. It's something that we heard already this morning with Guy Wollart, then we heard it again with Naveen. It's not just something that we feel, it is actually really happening. Technology is taking an exponential growth. We see virtual reality popping up, we see drone technologies popping up, you see uh, blockchain, we hear chatbot technology, we hear about artificial intelligence, and I, you probably heard this week also from the WWDC 17 from Apple that they are launching uh, an augmented reality kit that allows developers to really work on these technologies. So that means that these technologies are really accessible to the market. Now, what does that mean? Technologies bring up new customer needs, bring up new customer opportunities. And at this point, what I see is that a lot of corporations at this point are struggling to keep up with these waves of new customer needs. There are various reasons why. It's mostly it's because they have quite a horrifying, and I don't want to offend anyone in the room, but corporations have horrifying uh, decision-making processes, which is difficult for them to keep the same speed as startups. The other reason is that in these corporations, you also have, for example, CEO switches or managing switches, which makes a lot of these innovation projects difficult to move forward. And of course, there's, they are very much related or uh, focused on their current target group. Now, fine, that's what's happening in these corporations, but at the same point, they see startups coming up in the market. And these startups are really going at a dazzling speed at this point, and they are outpacing these corporations, and they're disrupting them. And um, I think I'm pretty sure you heard in a lot of talks already about Airbnb, so I'm not going to talk too much about them. But what I want to say about that startup, and that is really fascinating to see, is that in nine years of time, they were able to double the market value of Marriott. Marriott is the biggest hotel chain in the world. And they've been able in nine years to double the market value with the triple amount of rooms. They have three million rooms. That's a triple of Marriott. And they've done that in nine years. They're now active in 190 countries. Now, that's quite fascinating. And it should really dazzle these different corporations because at this point, they are looking with fear to these startups. Why is this so different than before? Why is it different than 20 years ago? Now, one of the reasons is that these startups, they only need low cost and very low amount of resources to actually create a huge impact in the market. That's something that we see at this point. Um, to give you an example of that, which you all, you all know Instagram, of course, but who of you knew that when acquired by Facebook for $1 billion, there were only 13 employees? 13 employees, and you have a market value of $1 billion, well, that's quite amazing, and that was impossible a lot of years ago. And that makes these corporations think twice now about how they would ha have to handle this uh, situation. Now, because of the fact that they have this small and agile structure, they can also go into markets where these corporations cannot follow. They can go into really niche markets, take very small parts of the customer journey that are too small, or at first sight, they seem too low margins for the corporates, but eventually it could have a huge potential, of course. Now, the other part of that is since they go into these niche markets, they can go a lot closer to the customer needs. They can go a lot closer to tracking the customers, and eventually by going closer to the customer needs, they can provide a better product. Now, that's, a, that's what I want to say about the startups. Now, at the other hand, you have these corporates, and they actually have corporate structures that force innovation to go back and forth. 
and I'm just going to give you a couple of examples, and I'm pretty sure you're familiar with it, is, for example, uh, there is this hierarchy ladder that is in these corporations, and a lot of managers get switched the whole time, and that forces innovation projects to get back into the fridge. CEO switches, new vision in the company, five different uh, innovation projects just get out of, the, out of the way because it doesn't fit into the vision or it doesn't help certain managers to, to level up. But that's, of course, not the purpose of these innovation projects. They have to get to the market. So they have difficult, difficulties with executing. Now, the other point of this is that when these innovation projects really do get to the market, there is way too much still attached to the corporate strings. How can you take the startup speed that you need to compete in the market with the decision-making processes that you have in these corporations. And what we see now is that certain corporations are trying to set up these corporate startup initiatives, but they are actually failing due to the fact that they lack methodology at this point. So those are struggles that we see in the market and um, that we also have seen how certain corporations have tackled them and overcome them. So the question remains, what is the best strategic response to that fast-changing market that we are into. Into these very exciting times, how do you act as a corporation? Now, one of the ways we see in the market is that corporations start to acquire these startups. Like, for example, uh, you have Walmart that has bought Jet for, for $3.3 billion. That's a year ago. Uh, Jet is actually an online experience where you can buy a lot of products, and they help you to give more transparency in this buying process, and they help you to save money on these different products. So that's one thing that you see. Another example is, for example, Unilever that is buying the Dollar Shave Club. I'm pretty sure some of you are quite familiar with the advertising of the Dollar Shave Club with the CEO running through his production line with the shaving tools. Very clear value proposition. You have $1 a month, and you have your uh, shaving tools pro provided for you. Unilever has chosen to acquire this company in order probably to, uh, to compete in the market with Gillette. Now, another example just early this year is Ford that is putting $1 billion into Argo AI. Argo AI is a startup that's active in artificial intelligence and robotics. And probably one of the main reasons why Ford did this is to go to more to the uh, next level of self-driving cars. So these companies are putting dollars, uh, millions of dollars in these, in these startups. And the question that remains is innovation then a billion dollar game? Is it a billion dollar ball game where you can only do acquisitions? Well, my personal opinion is that it's definitely not. I see a lot of these corporations are way too reactive to the market. They wait until there is a startup that comes into the market. They wait too long until that startup actually comes to a certain value that they have to pay a billion dollars to buy it. Just imagine what you could do with a billion dollar in, your, in innovation. Just imagine if you would put five startups in the market Five startups with the same kind of money, you can still have $200 million for each of those startups. That's quite some money to start a startup. So my opinion is that corporate should not only invest in, but they should collaborate with and they should develop ventures. That is really important for me that corporates have moved, like acquisition has been there since 20 years ago. It's just a trend the last couple of years because there's a lot of new startups coming up, but really to collaborate with them and to develop them themselves, that's the real challenge that corporations are facing with. And that terminology in that is called corporate venturing. And for me, corporate venturing is the speed, is the key to the speed innovation. Now, to go more into that, why would companies do this? Why would companies choose for this corporate venturing? One of the reasons is to go for the speed, the, the speed that they're jo so jealous of, of the startups. You can create it by yourself. If you put a team together or you collaborate in an early stage with a startup, you will see that you will access the market way faster than you're doing right now in your innovation project. The second thing is new core business potential. Don't all, only focus on what you're doing today, but what is gonna be your revenue stream in five years? Be busy with different markets. Be thinking about what are you gonna do in five years? Which technologies are you gonna use? If you focus too much on your current, on your current business, it might be that in five years you're not in the game anymore. Think about what Naveen was saying this, this morning about maybe some big corporates that we see today might not be able to be there anymore in 10 years. So invest in the future. And that is related also to my third statement in that, and that is having a window on the market. Collaborating with the startups Developing themselves gives you the opportunity to broaden your horizon, not only to what you're doing today, but also looking forward to what you could be doing tomorrow. And that is also very much related to risk mitigation. Let me take the example again of what I was saying about the $1 billion. If you have $1 billion, you can put it into an acquisition of one company, 
or you can put it in 10 different ones and start them yourself. Then you still have $1 million for each startup. I think that's quite fair to start a startup. I think a lot of startups would be jealous of this funding to start, a, to start their uh, business with. And then the last thing, which is not to be forgotten, and it's also something that Kareen was already mentioning from Agoria in the previous talk, is the fact that, of course, it is also very important for your company culture. One of the big things that corporates are facing with today is attracting and retaining talent. And why is that? The main reason why is because you, if you go to a corporation, still a lot of people think that they're going into a new corporate where they have a big brand, they're, but they're kind of entering a golden cage where they might have a good salary, but they don't really have any challenge. And corporate venturing can really be seen as a new way to see this culture in a different way. Then, of course, comes the question, fine, I'm talking about corporate venturing. What does that mean? How, you, how can you do this? Now, the, the terminology of corporate venturing has already been there since maybe 20 years ago, and, but that was mainly into CVC investment or it was in acquiring. But now you see it moving much more to the, to the fuzzy front phase of the innovation where it is really about also searching for ideas and really starting from scratch. And there you see new techniques popping up like incubators, accelerators, um, you see scouting missions, you see hackathons. All of these techniques are quite new uh, in the last couple of years that they've been developed and they're really also rising in the market. Now, if you want to see this repertoire, you can see that it has grown to a certain maturity level that at this point it can be spread out over the different phases of a startup. And there you can clearly see that on your right side, you see that the acquisition of CVC investment was more traditional to how companies looked at corporate venturing. When the actual scale-up was there, when the risk was already taken by another startup, they chose to acquire them. But now you see a lot of techniques that move much forward to really, from scratch, like searching for the customer needs, searching for what is the value proposition that you want to put out in the market. And there you see techniques popping up like scouting missions, to look for startups in the market or hackathons, but it's important that all of these initial ideas, like hackathons, in my opinion, is that they should lead to, of course, an exist to an idea that comes to the market. And that's where these accelerators, incubators, and venture development studios like ourselves are really important to also involve the execution of these startups, because that is the main challenge where a lot of corporates are um, faced with today. And that is also what I would like to focus on what I find interesting, and it's also a part where we as a company have most of experience in right now, is really developing a venture from scratch. Starting from, you don't even know yet what you're going to do, so it's quite risky what the game you're taking there, and really developing an idea from scratch till the market. And that is what I find very triggering, where a lot of companies are still afraid of to do this, um, and the two techniques, incubators and venture development studios, are quite alike in that. The incubators, like uh, Karim was mentioning, also the Home for Innovation from BNP Paribas is a very good example of an internal incubator. Venture development studios can be seen as the same thing, but where multiple companies plug in into one central place where these ventures are developed. So the, both techniques start from the same angle. What is interesting there is that corporates are actually in pole position to develop these ventures. They don't realize it themselves sometimes, but they have the market access. They have the distribution channels to really bring this venture immediately to a big amount of uh, users. The second thing is not only the market access, but they can also have the market knowledge. There is a lot of ideas within their network that are just very valuable and that can lead immediately to successful startups if they would leverage that market knowledge and if they would leverage this, um, this network that they have. And then the third point is the workforce. I think that's quite logical. There some, some of these companies have 200, sometimes up to 6,000, um, sometimes even more people in their company. And all of them have a variety of skills. There are like business skills, marketing skills, sales skills. All of these skills are super relevant in these different trajectories of startups. Then the next point is funding. This is really the top reason why all the startups fail. If you go and find it on Google, it's the top reason everywhere, funding. And corporations can really play in a complete different ball game. Startups are like they're running from the one investor to the next one, and they're sometimes even forgetting about their product because they first need their investment. Now, corporations have a different situation. They can actually fund not only one startup, but they can fund def different startups or collaborate with different startups. And corporates should also see it from that perspective. They really can have a different ball game in this in this funding part. And 
And then the other thing is, of course, the economies of scale. Since they can produce at a big mass production, they can lower the price easier uh, from a corporate perspective. And then, last but not least, is the facilities. If you see incubators, accelerators out there, one of the main aspects why these techniques are chosen is because the startups get facilities there, they get coaches there. That's really an asset that these corporations have. Now, fine, I'm talking about that these corporates are in the pole position to develop them. Why are they not doing it then? And one of the main reasons is, I think, because they're way too reactive to the market, that they wait until somebody else invents something and then they can acquire it. But another very important reason that I see in the market is that corporates just don't believe in their own people. If we set up new ventures with corporations and we ask for the resources to put into our projects, in the past, we got a lot of answers of people, managers telling me, like, yeah, but I'm not sure if we have those entrepreneurs within our corporation which sounds quite bizarre, and I don't want to offend any corporations in this room because a lot of corporations are moving away from this, but still a lot of them are not believing in the entrepreneurs that they have within their own corporation. If we ask for the resources, they say we don't have the entrepreneurs, but two months later, when we're looking at the competitive landscape, it's the same people that tell me that their biggest competitor was built by ex-employees. That's quite strange if you hear it. So for me, the answer is not the fact that you don't have the entrepreneurs. The fact is that you should, the answer is to nurture this entrepreneurship. And specifically on this point, I would like to give you seven takeaways to take with you to how to think about this entrepreneurship in a different way. And one of them, the first one of them is dynamics. How do you create the dynamics within your company? And I think a lot of corporations should still move away from the fact that the marketing manager is a little bit of innovation on the side. Mostly it's the marketing managers that do this. Or the product managers, they have like a side task of innovation. Really like think more in setting up disruption squads and not only one set of different teams that work around innovation dare to think about your future. And it's the same thing when you think about resource allocation. There is a lot of um, There's a lot of uh, companies that we used to work with, it changed over time, of course, but in the projects that we were, sometimes we got the answer like, okay, uh, we can, you can work with these people, but they can only work on Monday and Tuesday on, on these projects. But then I'm like, okay, but how are we able to compete in the market with people that work day and night, day and night to bring a new startup to the market, and I have half the resources to work in this new startup? It, that's, that's just a contradiction that is difficult to work with, of course. And the third thing is also, do you work in your own headquarters or do you create decentralized or external locations? And I think you have to find a good balance in this to really think about certain projects need to breathe innovation in a different way and they cannot have lunch with your people, the day-to-day -day people every day. Give them, get, let them breathe innovation in a different location. That's very important. And then I think for me, the most important part of the seven tips that I can give you is how do you incentivize your people? You're competing with people on the market that are incentivized by building a startup on the market, and you are incentivizing your people with fixed fees and a nine-to-five job. That is quite difficult if you put those two in a balance with each other. I'm not saying everybody in this room is doing it. I'm just saying that a lot of people that I've seen were doing it in the past. And it is very difficult to, to, to do this, but as a company, you should think about how can we create incentives for entrepreneurs within our company, make it interesting for them, that they can also work day and night on an idea, that they can really work towards going to this market. Um, and then there is, of course, the process, which is, I guess, the first thing that a lot of you people would say is uh, agile processes. It's in every room that I'm at, uh, it's, people are talking about agile processes. We have to have an agile structure. But I don't see so many companies that actually have it. Who of you actually has a structure where you can say that team has a fixed independent budget, they can crash with it on the market, they can do whatever they want, they have full autonomy, and they can grow while doing. I'm very happy that you have it. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that some of you have it more, I'm not saying all corporations are at this point, but it's a shift that you should make. And I see that it's also really working in the corporations that we've worked with, they are now in a different ball game where, it can, where you see that people are incentivized in a different way and where they can grow while doing. He was also telling us this morning about research and development takes too much time sometimes. Sometimes you just have to go and grow while doing. So that's really about the process. Again, I think a lot of you know it. I just wonder who actually does it and put it into practice. Um, and then the ownership is quite the same as what I was saying about the incentive model. Uh, 
not only work with your intern, uh, internal people that way, but if you ask external people like ourselves to put skin into the game and to think with you on a long-term relationship, then also think about joint IP. We, are, we have a couple of joint ventures at this point with big corporates uh, within Belgium, but also international, and that really creates a long-term relationship and really b makes a completely different mindset. Also do it with the startups that you invest in. If you invest in startups, don't immediately acquire them, but let them have their own culture and let them have also part of this IP ownership. And then uh, there's the last part, so number seven of the takeaway that I would like to give you to you today is there are a lot of people that think that they still have to bring these new startups under their, under their current brand, under the umbrella brand. There are three reasons why I would not do this. First of all, you want very transparent feedback from your customer if you put a new product in the market. They will not answer to you in a transparent way if they know it's related to your brand, in a good and in a bad way. Some will choose for it because they were, trust, they were trustworthy to the old brand. Some will not buy it because of the fact that it's related to that other brand. Another reason is that it can also hurt your brand image. If your startup crashes on the market, then it will involve something to your brand image, to your umbrella brand, or even if you go to certain target groups that are not really related to your current target groups, you have to just bring it under a different name. Um, and then the last reason for this is that these, your customer actually wants, and I think the Dollar Shave Club is a very good example of this, your customer just wants very clear value propositions. They want to see, like for Dollar Shave Club, it's a clear brand, it, the name is already saying what it does, you pay a dollar a month and you get your shaving tools. Very clear, and that is only possible if you bring it under a new brand. So that is actually the seven tips that I would like to give you around how to create this entrepreneurship mindset within your corporation. And with that, I would like to end this 30 minutes with challenging you in how can you beat yourself at your own game? I still see a lot of companies that wait for somebody else to, bu to build their biggest competitor. And if you wait too long, then maybe that other competitor will buy you if you wait too long. Why are you, why are you letting somebody else build your, com your biggest competitor in the future? Or why are you not entering new markets yourself? Build yourself, uh, beat yourself at your own game, and therefore dare to disrupt from the inside out. Don't always look for outside in perspectives on innovation. You have the potential, you have the people, you just have to nurture it, and you have to work with them. That, I'm not saying that investing is, is, a, is a wrong choice, that's definitely not what I wanted to say in this talk, but combine it with these other techniques as well, because we still see that a lot of companies choose, especially for this investing in, because it seems to be a less risk, but actually you're also investing a lot of money sometimes into the startups. So that is what I would like to have shared with you in this 20 minutes, uh, but of course I'm very open to have a chat with you afterwards if we could have a drink about your thoughts about corporate venturing, or you can always visit our website. Uh, there is also a, a specific area, a specific block around corporate venturing where you can find entrepreneur stories from entrepreneurs that we've talked to, or our own cases in there, or uh, more information about what we do. So I thank you very much for your time that you've uh, spent this 30 minutes with me, and I hope you will have much more inspiration in the upcoming day and tomorrow. Thank you very much.